Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 158 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting and hear from the knife designers, the makers, the manufacturers, the reviewers, anybody that is in the uh, knife business, the knife game, just knives in general. We want to talk to them. And that's what the Sunday weekend show is all about, a chance to uh, dive deep and uh, talk to folks in the knife industry. So, Bob, who do we have the pleasure of hearing from today? Uh, today I'm speaking with Nick Timpson of Birdvis Knives. And uh, as you may know, well, as you definitely know, I've been on a traditional and slip joint knife tear recently. That's where, just where my mind keeps going. And it's what I'm, I'm really interested in uh, currently. You know, my, my interests come in sine waves. They come and go. But, uh, but right now I'm really into traditionals and I'll be back. Uh, and uh, well, Ryan, our good friend Ryan Spirited Blades, mm -hmm. hit me to Birdvis Knives, showed us one oh, cool. on uh, Thursday Night Knives, and <clears throat> man, I've been haunting his IG ever since. Well, good thing you said haunting in the Halloween spirit and not stalking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. Stalking is the next step. <laughs> oh, no, no, let's don't do that. Haunting for the Halloween, and uh, maybe we'll have uh, some... Uh, some um, Halloween requests for an upcoming Thursday night knives as we uh, approach the Halloween season, but uh, oh, yes. more on that, to, more on that to come, but uh, we'll get to an honor, our interview in just a second, but I do want to let you know that our podcast and uh, video show is brought to you in part today by dailydeals.click. You can get curated daily deals delivered right to your email inbox every day. It's great for small business owners and anyone looking to save money on products that they uh, need in their business. That's dailydeals.click, dailydeals.click. It's uh, your chance to uh, save some money. And again, those emails are delivered to your email box every single day, free of charge. You don't have to do a thing, but go to dailydeals.click and sign up for them. So that interview is coming up next. Ever order a knife online and have it delivered to the office so your wife doesn't know? Chances are you're a knife junkie. So I'm here today uh, with Nick Timpson of Birdvis Knives. Nick, it is a pleasure having you, sir. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. And as I as I uh, mentioned in our setup to this, uh, you came on my radar uh, very abruptly uh, with um with a purchase that a good friend of the show, uh, Spirited Blades, made of one of your knives, and ever since I've been, I've been fantasizing. I've been going to your 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 web page and just looking at at the things you're making. Uh, for those who don't know you, uh, tell us the kind of knives you make and and tell us how you got here. Well, I right currently I I make traditional slip joint knives, so. Um, you might be familiar with, I'm, and I'm sure most people are familiar with uh, GECs or case knives or queen cutlery and a, a number of um, traditional slip joint knives. Um, and the, the reason we say traditional is because they're made in a, in a, in a fashion that's been around for hundreds of years and it's still, it's still popular today. And um, that's, that's where I've started and that's what my focus is right now. And it seems to be, it seems to be a pretty hot market and a hot uh, place to be. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Um, the way I got into it and actually it's, it's a way that I recommend uh, a lot of guys that are interested in making slip joint knives begin, but it's um, taking apart old slip joints, maybe uh, less expensive ones to begin with. And then, um, putting them back together, putting new handles on, new handle covers on them. And um, that's where I started. And that's where I learned how a slip joint needs to work and how all those parts need to, um, need, need to work together to, to make a good slip joint. And I did that for a while, um, maybe about a, a, maybe a little over a year, I was taking apart old knives, modifying old knives, People would send me their knives and I put new handles on them. And then um, 
when I had the space in a for a, for a shop and at my own home, I was able to get the the more elaborate equipment that I needed to make slip joints from scratch. That's funny you say elaborate equipment because recently you had a, a video on your Instagram showing your process of making um, making the shield and inlaying the shield, and yeah. I was shocked. I was shocked at how hands-on it is. I mean, uh, because you you look at one of the first things you go to, uh, one of the first things my eye goes to on those many pictures of your knives on your website are, is your very unique shield. And uh, the oh, fit, yeah. the fit just looks gorgeous. And then, well, so tell us how you, how do you, how do you get that all together? Well, it's funny because when I, when I first started doing this shield, I was still doing those, those mods or those refurbished knives. And um, like the, the federal shield or the, the shield that you might uh, picture when you think of a slip joint knife, that was, that was out of my abilities at the time. And so I made this really simple shield. And um, I actually, the first few that I did, um, that I inlaid in the knife, I used these little tiny wood carving chisels, like wood carving knives. And I mm -hmm. did it completely by hand. Wow. And that was just uh, not sustainable. <laughs> and but I still do it in a, in a more hands-on uh, technique than you might think. A, a lot of people now will use the uh, a panograph. Yes, that's um, what I assumed naturally. Yeah, and it's it's an old machine, but it's it's very applicable and still relevant today. Um, describe describe for people who don't know what a panograph is, real quick. So a panograph is, and I'm holding up two hands for those that, that can't see me, but um, you'll have a stylus in one hand to trace a pattern or a template. And then the, you'll have the motor with the milling bit in the, um, attached by a various um, system of arms and they're linked together. So whatever you do with your stylus on um, tracing that pattern, it, it transfers it over to your work and um, you can scale it down. So typically the pattern will be many times bigger than what you're actually trying to do. And, um, You'll trace that and it'll it will mill it into your handle material. And um, in my case, I don't have one of those. And so I do it all by hand. I use I actually use an old dental drill that I acquired from an old dentist. So, yeah, you, you can go to my go to my YouTube, which has just a couple videos. You can see that video there or my um, Instagram and you can see that that dental drill. Wow. That's funny. Uh, with the with the that video, when you're showing that process in particular, I was looking at that and I'm like, is that a very small bit for for a uh, Dremel, or is that? Yeah. But it has that sort of dental bit sound, you know, that that just makes your stomach stomach drop. So yeah, and uh, it's it's funny. Whenever I I see my current dentist, I'm like, hey, you got any uh, old bits? And he he just keeps them to the side, and he'll give me a handful of bits when I whenever I ask for them. So it's <laughs> cool. It's been pretty useful. So, so your knives, uh, slip joint knives, um, you're making them entirely by hand. Is that right? I mean, obviously you're using machines, but, but you're, uh, tell us a little bit about your process and, and, and your design process. How much of this is happening on paper before you turn it, uh, turn it to metal and, and micarta? Honestly, almost, almost none of it is happening on paper before I get started. Um, now the, the model or the, the pattern that I came up with my own, my, my first original pattern, the Hitchcock uh, started as a sketch. Do and you have a Hitchcock that you can hold up? I, so yeah, in a okay. way I've okay. got my, um, I've got my work in progress. So it's mm -hmm. in pieces currently, okay. but I can put it in, sort of hold it in the way that it's going to look. So for viewers and listeners who are who are not familiar with uh, traditional or slip joint knives, there are a lot of patterns. It's kind of like the Great American Songbook. There are songs that every musician knows and sings. Well, it's right. the same thing with traditional knives. There are trapper patterns, there are barlows, there are, you know, just patterns that that run through but but you just created your own pattern called Correct. that you call the Hitchcock. Yeah. So um, 
I, I think I'm now I'm go, going off on a tangent. I want to find out about your design and build process. But, but before we get there, tell me about what is a Hitchcock and 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 how did you get to that design? OK, well, um, at, like you were saying, there are so many, so many patterns in the traditional knives with the slip joints. Like um, you've got the Lanny's clip, which is a very popular pattern now. You've got the Barlow, which has been around for ages. Um, trappers. I mean, we, we go on and on and on about these patterns. And the unique, one of the unique things about the the world of slip joints is makers are openly share these patterns. So you'll have many, many makers doing their iteration of each pattern their take on it and they might add their style or they might stay very true to the actual patterns like um tony bows is responsible for a number of those patterns like the lanny's clip mm -hmm. and some might stay true to the actual tony bows pattern and then some might um try try their own sort of iteration of it and um, I, that's one thing that's unique about slip joints is the sharing of patterns. And now there is, so then for me, I wanted to be able to make a pattern that, that would be um, attributed to me and that eventually I would be able to share. Right now I'm not quite ready to let it go because it mm -hmm. is still fairly new and I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on a kick with making that pattern. Um, but someday I'll, I'll let it go and I'd like to see that and, and see what other makers would do with it. So um, the things that make the Hitchcock unique. So how about I show you the, I'll show you the prototype and where it started. Sure. Now, this is the prototype of the Hitchcock. And mm. so you can see that it's got a Warncliffe style blade. And you can see that I use this. This is my daily carry. Um, it's got this unique step in the handle here. Mm -hmm. and I've, I've come to call it the shoulder. Um, whether or not that, that I should call it that, that's what I call it in my head. Um, you've got a slight belly in the blade, but the difference in from the hit, the prototype to the, current mm -hmm. um, to where it is currently, you can see that I've dropped the nail neck down the blade. You might call it, say that it's a little bit more aggressive and mm -hmm. this blade is just rough ground. I haven't done any hand finishing on it yet. So that's why it's looking like that. And this one's dirty. So nothing pretty here guys. Sorry. <laughs> um, but you can see how the, the the progression. Now the actual sketch that I began with looked much more like what it is now mm -hmm. than what the prototype started. But because everything that that I start is sort of freehand, and I'm just trying to get um, to a certain place that I like. And even though this the prototype, it's a decent knife and it works well and everything functions as it should. It didn't quite look like what I wanted it to. And that's why the, the final design looks the way it looks different than the prototype. Okay. So let's, let's double back. You were talking, we were talking design uh, before I diverted into the Hitchcock, but we were talking about design and uh, materials and building. And you said that very little of the process happens on the paper. So describe to me what the price process is like. I've been drawing my whole life and I know you sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and there the stakes are very low you can do whatever you want and uh and then get a different piece of paper it's different when you're free balling it with a knife how does that work well it, it's not it's not much different than than sitting down and drawing with a with pencil and paper you know i grew up my whole life i i called myself an artist and i thought i would grow up uh, to be an artist and um I, in a way I am and you did <laughs> <laughs> but I, I never thought that it would that it would manifest itself in this way but um, to be honest I will I will spread out some layout fluid on my steel and I'll scratch the I'll scribe the design into the steel just like you would be drawing so what the, the thing that the most important part 
it is that tang. So the back square and your kick, that's the most important part. It doesn't matter so much what, what shape the blade is when you're starting a knife, depending on what you're starting. As long as this works with the spring, it doesn't, you can turn this into, you can turn this into any, just about any knife you want it to, you want to. So I've got a, uh, I've got a template of a Hitchcock and I'll just use this part. I'll scribe this onto the steel and then I'll just draw the, whatever blade shape I want. Like if I want to make a Lanny's clip, I'll draw, I'll scribe a Lanny's clip on the end of this. Or if I want to make a Zulu, I'll scribe a Zulu on the end of this. So that's the core of the whole design. It's like, I've heard a lot of uh, knife makers who make uh, say, for instance, uh, titanium frame locks say that I use the same lockup on every knife and I start with the lockup and the pivot and yeah. then I, I go outwards. Yeah. Cause it, th this is the hardest part to get right. The, the tang, the, getting the, that back square and, and making it work in all the positions. Cause you know that um, you want it to be flush in the open, the half stop and the closed. Position. Okay. So if you get that right once, why, why, you why fight it every time? Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you this. Uh, Cause uh, I, like I told you before we started rolling here, I've, uh, you know, I've been collecting knives my whole life and always really went for the more aggressive stuff. But in the last 10 to 15 years, I've been I've been appreciating my gentlemanly side. I've been accumulating a lot of uh, mm -hmm. a lot of slip joints. And there is something very pleasing about the about the uh, flush lock at the half stop. Yeah. You know, uh, at the at the halfway position. Uh, but w but when I don't get that on a new knife, I, you know, I'm never. I'm never like bummed to you, a, a maker of this who just declared that that is an important thing. Why, what does that signify to you? I think for starters, I think it's, um, it's a, it's an indicator to the collector of the level of crafts craftsmanship that is going into a knife, the, the attention to detail. It's not essential in any way to the function of the knife. It it doesn't it doesn't add any functionality to the knife. It just adds that um, aesthetic, just that that just touch of detail, mm -hmm. that extra, that just that little extra that shows that this that this person, this maker, is serious about what they do, and that they that they're trying. So. Um, where it started as I think a a safety feature in a slip joint, you know, you you open a knife with a really stiff spring and you 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 get it to the half stop, you can adjust your grip mm -hmm. and open it, and then on the other end, closing it, you can close it to the half stop, move a hand, and then close it all the way. Um, but nowadays, I think it's a what it really is is an indicator to the collector of what type of, of maker they're they're dealing with. I I would uh, like I said it doesn't it's not a deal breaker when I don't get that but I would agree with you. You yeah. experience that and and it feels more luxurious and and we have to admit that these are luxury items especially your knives. Oh my God, your beautiful custom slip joints are the height of luxury. Thank you, you know. Uh, but 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 no doubt. Uh, well, from what I've heard, uh, they function beautifully too. And that's um, we we were saying that you you grew up to be an artist, like you thought you all would always be. But yeah. But I, I would I would say you grew up to be a designer because to me, art can only be appreciated. It cannot be used, and your and your work can most certainly be be used. Um, so what? Uh, why? traditionals why slip joints what is your inspiration um you know I, I think it started because of the gecs and the and the queen cutlery and the shatton morgans mm -hmm. where um at, i i really liked the look of those and i had like a couple case knives that i carried around um but i i wanted those great eastern cutleries but at the time they were out of my budget and they're not, they're not expensive knives, so to speak, but um, they, they're, they're not, 
they're not a cheap knife, you know? Right. And um, at the time I wasn't, I didn't have the budget to spend on great Eastern cutleries. And I saw this thing where the, uh, these guys on a, in a, uh, one of the, in blade forms, I think it was, were taking these old Camillus TL 29 electrician's knives. I think you showed one the other day. Yeah. 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 I don't know I if it's Camillus, but oh, yeah. No, wrong one, but yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> They've got the bail like that. They've got this flathead screwdriver blade and the wire, wire stripper blade and then the spear blade on there. It's and, a, cut, uh, a cut master. Yes, 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 yes. So um, these guys were taking those apart. I mean, that's a $15 knife on eBay all day long. Mm -hmm. and, um, they put new handles on, new covers on them, whether it was uh, some jig bone or some micarta. And I saw that and I thought I could probably do that. And so I went on eBay and I bought a few of those things and I split them apart. And by the, I think the end of a week I had made five <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it was, it's just something that about being able to take a knife that was a, a decent, a fine knife and turning it into something special. And there's just a, oh, there's almost a spirit to a traditional Split joint knife. Yeah, that other knives don't necessarily have. Yeah, and, right, right, and and that's I think there's something about the slip joint knife that's kind of there's the nostalgia to it. There's the the tradition. There's the the kind of slow down and enjoy the the process of using your knife. Not everything needs to be quick deploy. Yeah. Practical. Yeah, well, there's this, there's this, uh, um, there's this feeling with a, a a slip joint knife, especially that this is not about stabbing people. And believe me, like that's that's a big part of. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I like tactical knives, and you know, you can't help but but uh, access the the younger part of your brain, uh, the fantasies. Of, but this 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 uh, this access is a different part of my brain. Yeah. Like you said, nostalgia for sure. I'm a sentimental guy and my first knives were for my grandfather. There are all these old slip joints and cut masters and such. And, uh, but also you're, you're using it to cut something. You're using yeah. it to be self-reliant. You're using it to um, divide something uh, precisely. Yeah. And there's something very pleasing about that. Well, there's, there's something uh, I think it's, I think it's become part of us as, as humans over the, however long we've been on earth where the, a cutting and edged cutting tool is one of the oldest tools that humans have ever used. We've been using knives uh, almost as long as probably we've been using fire and, um, or, you know, a knife in some fashion, whether it's a stone to, to cut something or to, like you said, to divide something into um, pieces. And um, there's just, I think that's why the knife community is so strong is because it's just, it's in us. It's like, um, it's like why we love the flavor of smoked food. Mm. It, it's part of us. It, it's, it's deeper than something we learn. It's just in us to, to enjoy a knife beyond um, a weapon or a defensive tool you know it's it's such a useful uh, thing it's a real sim uh symbol of self-reliance too and to me that's uh growing up that's what it was you know my uh my grandfather's generation they all carried pocket knives and my grandfather i mean he he was born in you know my grandfathers were born in 1908 they rode trains they 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 did fishing they did all sorts of tom sawyer stuff sure. they had a pocket knife with them yeah. you know all the time and um, something about that um, keeps me coming back to tr two traditional knives. Like I told you, I cycled through. I went through a Bowie knife phase recently, and and that blossomed yet again into a a, a slip joint phase. And and um, well, each time I come back to the slip joint phase, I realize a, a huge part of it are the materials. To me, I love jigged bone, and certain yeah. colors just you know, strum the hard chords. What, yeah. what are the materials that I, I know you love my card of it? Tell me yeah. about the materials you, you love and why you love them and what, what about them uh, resonates with you? I probably love, not probably. I, I like my card the most. I think um, it's, 
the variety now is, and I shouldn't say the, the variety now, but the, it's the vintage types of micarta, the old stuff mm. that is so cool because it's taken on a patina over the years. Like, I don't know if you can see this real well, but I'm, I'm holding up uh, the piece that I'm working on. God. And what, what I have up top is a maroon linen micarta. And this is a modern um, production micarta. And it's, it, you definitely can't see it well. But then the lower part is a, is a Westinghouse vintage mm. um, micarta. And you can see there, um, for those that are watching, you can see that they're, the gradient of color, you've got the darker hmm. colors yeah. on top and then the lighter colors in the middle. And that's because it's an old material. It's darkened on the outside and it's aged. And I love that. Um, that's beautiful. And that combination of colors, that maroon with that ochre color is just so and, nice. Yeah, there's there's just a there's a richness to, to my carta. Let me see here, where am I going? Yeah. yeah and and luckily you know first of all uh well my carta comes in so many varieties they're all tasty yeah. and luckily it it's also extremely functional you know with yeah. with with how its grippiness is ex, you know is is better it's, when it's wet it, and all that kind of stuff it's a tough material you can leave it more um unfinished to for texture but it, it'll take a great polish um there, there's also something neat about taking something that was once something else or used for something else. Like some of them, you know, they were, they were pulleys, they were, um, they were panels, floor panels in a World War II bomber. They were, I mean, all kinds of cool stuff that you yeah. find in my carta in. And that's part of the, the, the hunt or part of the fun of it is hunting for, what was my carta used for mm -hmm. and searching for those things to try to find that, that special my carta and my carta is uh, a brand name of Westinghouse just to be clear that um, is now synonymous for the, the phenolic uh, types of resin cast materials. Like, um, you know, general electric made it a whole bunch of companies made, um, a, a type of their type of micarta. So um, Westinghouse coined the the name or, or gave it the name micarta, and that's kind of what's stuck. So my my brother collects World War II um, military helmets from around the world, and in the United States uh, during that era, there was a an inner helmet or an, like an inner casing, and then the outer helmet, and that inner casing uh -huh. that had the webbing and everything. Um, that was made out of micarta, yeah. and yeah. it is really stunning to look at, especially yeah. through the lens of, oh, this would make a great knife handle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen some uh, construction hard hats that are micarta. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's something about the material that is very warm. You know, uh, well, physically, like if, if you're out in the cold and you have a micarta handle knife and you need to use it, it's going to be physically warmer than if you have a titanium handle, but something about the, the look and the, the yeah. quality of it. Um, so you've been making slip joints uh, since, uh, well, you've been a, a full-time company since what, 2017, a couple of years now? Yeah, I think about, I've been doing this about just over two years now, full-time. Okay. So uh, now I am not making assumptions. I don't mean to be uh, 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 putting my, you know, my lens over yours, but if, if you were to eventually do a locking knife, mm -hmm. would you, how, how, what would that look like? Well, I've done, I've made a couple lockbacks. Okay. Uh, That's what I was getting at. Is it, would it be a more traditional lock or? Yeah. So to be precise, I've made, I've made two lockback knives. I did, I think they were both trappers. If I'm remembering one was for sure a trapper. I think one might've been a Lanny's clip. Um, but I do have plans to make a tail lock, uh, Hitchcock. So I don't know if, if you're familiar with a tail lock or not, but it, it's essentially, it's the same mechanism as a lock back, you know, a, a, you know, a buck 110, mm -hmm. same mechanism, but you've pulled the, the locking, the, the, the release clear back onto the, the rear corner of the, the back of the knife. 
And so um, you almost had, it maybe gives you more leverage, but um, it's just, it's just another form of a lock back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But, but the lock is for the action. The button is just further back or the. Correct. Correct. And so there, there's that. Um, I would love to make, you know, more uh, modern styles, you know, flippers and, and stuff like that. But I'm just, I'm just not there yet. Mm -hmm. The flip joints for me are, I've got it down it's going really well. And they seem to be slip joints in general right now seem to be pretty hot. I think, I mean, I think you have found yourself a nice niche because uh, I mean, you're obviously a big, I, I was watching a video where you were showing your very first slip joint knife that you took to the California yeah. blade show. I believe it was. Blade blade show show West Coast. Yeah. I mean, right. that was your first knife. I, obviously you're a craftsman. Obviously you can <laughs> handle yourself in the shop. Sure. The, but the, what, what I really appreciate is that you have a good eye for design of this kind of knife. Also, it's not just like, Oh, I'm doing this because I, I don't quite have the chops to do a titanium frame lock, which no doubt you do. If you look at your knives, but it seems like you do have a real love for this style. What uh, in your collecting before you actually started making them, or maybe you still do collect other people's knives? What what slip joints do you like? What patterns do you like? What makers do you like? Uh, you know, I like a I like a two bladed um, jack. You know, like mm -hmm. uh, the the blades open on the same end. I like a pen blade and a either a spear blade or a clip point. I one of my favorite favorite knives was the um, the Case Texas Jack. Oh yes, great did, little knife. It's a great little knife, and I think they make a they make a bigger one, and then they make a, a smaller one. It's and, on the serpentine. It's on the little serpentine. Yeah, brand. yeah, yeah. And I I just really liked that knife, and I that was one of the knives that I carried for ages before I started making slip joints, and I I just love that little Texas Jack. Um, I love the, the, the perfect little spear blade. And then that just really useful clip point. I love a clip point blade. Um, I should, I should make more. Um, I've got this guy and this is a Laney's clip. God. And this, I might mention, uh, I'm thinking about doing a giveaway mm. and this hosts of, I'm sorry, to, to hosts of podcasts? Is that is that what you're doing? Um, it'll be on, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, maybe, maybe so. <laughs> uh, this will be, I'll, if I do a giveaway, I'll, I'll host it on Instagram. Um, and then, uh, but to tell you a little bit about this knife, this knife was recently published in uh, Blades uh, Knives 2021 book. Ooh, the book. big book, the big annual book. Yeah, and it's, nice, it's probably the smallest blurb about a knife maker in the entire <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's the first time I've been in a, in a book or a magazine, so it was pretty nice. exciting. So I'm going to give away, I think, I'm going to give away this knife with a copy of that book. And um, so, so look out for that. I made this knife about a year ago. I sent it out to one of the editors of the, of the book. And he, you know, carried it around for a couple weeks and took some pictures and and put it in their book. And it's it's a Laney's clip. It's got um, some Westinghouse, just natural Westinghouse micarta with some uh, ivorite up top. And it's a paper micarta up top and a canvas micarta down low. So keep an eye out for this on on my Instagram. That is a stunning, stunning knife. Um, you know, I, I keep I keep thinking about your handles, but then I look at your blades, and you do a lot of very interesting things with blades. The Hitchcock has a very interesting uh, 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 sheep foot worn cliff style with a slight belly thing going on. Your Lanny's clip uh, is beautiful. You have another blade style that is really cool, and it's uh, it's kind of like a Lanny's clip meets a Tanto. What's your what's your how do you decide how to design these things? You know, I, I've, I use a Ouija board. I get my Ouija board out <laughs> yeah. and I just sort of listen to the spirits. 
No, um, I I can't say that I have any one method. It's kind of just I I I look at I look at it, I eyeball it, and if it doesn't look right, I tweak it. If it looks right, I'll keep it. Um, sometimes they don't quite turn out the way that I want them to. Like I, so, this one, this is my um, this was one of the first knives I made with uh, bolsters, with stainless steel bolsters. This is a it's a Barlow style handle with a with, it's clip point Barlow, or maybe even more of a Lanny's clip blade uh, in a barlow and this might this is almost sort of what you're talking about the tanto but not it doesn't quite have that that corner yeah. there in the belly um but you know i kind of just kind of just play around and when it feels right i go with it um yeah actually i am thinking specifically it wasn't that i think it, it had a purple handle it was on one of the many beautiful uh it was one of the many knives on your on your page but it had something that was uh pretty close to a tanto i'm like that is yeah. so uh it's it's unusual to see in a slip joint and occasionally you do and i love it i love yeah. it um that kind of mashup to me you know a traditional blade style with a traditional knife style but they're from different cultures different times yeah yeah you know, I've so I've got this philosophy when it comes to traditional knives, and it's I should probably like put it down on paper um, because it, I, it's kind of just this philosophy that's floating around in my head. And I feel like with tr with slip joints or traditional knives, there there are certain boundaries that you should stay within, and then there are certain you can you can leave those boundaries but don't leave them too much, you know, like, um, and this is just me. I'm not saying that, you know, there, there are plenty of knife makers that are phenomenal craftsmen that do just nutty work. That's awesome. And it's, it's way out of the realm of traditional, but um, it, it still categorizes as a slip joint. But for me, there are things that, that you should and shouldn't do. Like um, I get asked a lot, would you ever put a pocket clip? on a slip joint and for me it's a no i'm not i probably won't put a pocket nut clip on a slip joint i can i don't get me wrong i see the usefulness and i see why you want it but to me that's one of those things that eh, i'm not going to go outside that boundary because i just don't I, I don't think it's right and it's just in me you know um so uh, do, do you do you feel like to do something like that you would have to internalize it first make it real make it come out of a a, a real and spontaneous place in your own self and then say uh, and then present to the world look slip joint with clip not because someone asked for it but because it came out of you yeah maybe so I, I think it would there there would be an inter internal struggle that I would have to <laughs> overcome before before that would happen but yeah there would definitely be uh some some justification that would need to be expressed before i did that i i think that um if you're going to make a niche in something like slip joint knives you are in a way a steward of the history of slip joint knives a part of that you know for this time and it is your responsibility to be somewhat responsible i know that doesn't sound like we were talking about being artists and, and such. Maybe that doesn't sound like uh, such a creative point of view, but I, I I would say that it is. You are the guardian in a way, or a guardian of this type of knife, this type of design, and you should push it. You should always push it and be creative. But I, once you once you cross over and you're putting a goddamn clip on your knife, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you, you start you start making changes. Suddenly, it changes the thing itself, and, and it's no longer that thing. No, and I, you, like the way, I like the way you said that you, you were stewards of, of something that, that's been around for hundreds of years. I, I've tried to look up how old slip joint knives are, you know, how long they've been around. Mm -hmm. And I can't find anything um, definitive because I think they've been around for so long in, in some way um, that it, they're, it's hard to nail it down. And it just, it really is uh a very traditional knife. So we're okay. High carbon versus stainless. I know you use a lot of stainless, right? Yeah. 
Uh, are you can are you do you use compl are you one hundred percent stainless steel with uh, your blades or? Right now, I am. I started out the first knives I made were uh, um, O1 tool steel. I, my my first knife here, you can see. I mean, it's it's pitted and and yeah, it's not in great shape. But um, but I the reason I started out on O1 is because I didn't have a kiln that I could um, heat treat stainless steel in at the time. And I could, you know, I could torch, um, I could torch temper some O1 tool steel. Um, and so that's why I started on O1. But the way somebody put it to me once was that it, he said, if I'm going to be charging these hundreds of dollars for my knives, I don't want my customer to pull out his knife someday and find it rusted out or find it with pits. And, and I kind of like, I was like, yeah, that's. That makes sense, you know. If if I'm, uh, you know, you you pay seven hundred dollars for a knife, and to some guys, seven hundred dollars is may maybe on the low end of the knives that they collect, but in other guys, it's it's up there, and it they might not use it. It might it might be that safe queen, or it might be the the knife that they really take care of, and then to find um, some some pepper marks on it or... Oh, or, God, yeah. It would be uh, disappointing. And then uh, there's not much a, that a maker can do at that point if you say, hey, my, my knife has some rust spots on it. There's not much I can do short of making a completely new blade to fix that, you know? The, the pits are there. That's... Uh, that I Okay, so this is the first time I've ever actually given this any thought, and it totally makes sense to me. There's always a slight disappointment, uh, in, uh, like, a um, well, I, I collect mostly GECs. Uh, so they're mostly carbon, but I, I like having the patina option. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I never, I never considered the fact that if you're looking at a custom knife, a custom slip joint knife, and it is highly likely that that will be a safe queen, something you're not using often, something that you break out for a wedding or a nice occasion, whatever it is, that there, that the possibility is great that you could pull it out that one time, you know, uh, every every quarter, and there's some rust on it, and how hacked and burned would you felt would you feel? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I I see how it makes sense to put um, to use the stainless. Yeah, and you know, I I can hear I can hear guys right now saying, "Well, take care of your knife," you know, <laughs> correctly. And yes, there's there's a lot you can do to prevent it, but I think. For many of us who've had those tool, tool steel or high carbon steel blades, you know that there's been that time when you opened up a knife that you've been taken care of or that you haven't done cut anything with yeah. and found that little spot on there and you're yeah. just like, how did that happen? And um, it, there, there are many precautions you can take, but it's sometimes out of your hands what happens. And, and I think that's... Uh, that's why I use one of the, one of the reasons why I use the stainless steel CPM 154 to be specific right now. That's one of my absolute favorite steels, CPM 154 and 154 CM that yeah. seem to have some very similar qualities. I love those, yeah. those blade steels. So um, growing from here, where does the company go from here? Birdvis knives. Where do you want Birdvis knives to be in five to 10 years? Uh, you'll definitely see uh, a production knife in some capacity, whether um, whether USA produced or overseas. You'll you'll see something from Birdvis knives um, that that brings uh, my knives to another market. You know, um, so that's something you'll see. Um, in the long run, I would like to do more modern style uh, locking knives, whether flippers or thumb stud or, you know, um, but, but liner locks and, and frame locks, titanium. I'd like to I'd like to venture into the more modern stylings and um, um, trends. Um, so you probably see some of that. Um, but the, you, you're always going to see the, the bird vis, uh, the cues that I like to maintain in my knives and my styling. You'll, I think you'll always know it's a bird vis when you see it. Um, like I've had guys that, that tell me they show their wives, you know, they're sitting there scrolling through Instagram and they say, Hey, look at that. And they've shown, shown their wife so many times that she says, 
oh, is that a bird this? She just knows. Not that she's into knives, but um, she knows it's a bird <laughs> And I think that's pretty cool. So I want my knives to be recognizable. <laughs> I, I want them to, to to stand out, but not but, so much that it's um, that they're crazy, that they're wild. Yeah, that could be your new T-shirt, Birdvis knives. Your wife knows. <laughs> <laughs> so, what kind of advice do you give? So you're you're kind of new in this game, but I mean to look at your knives and to and to listen to your plan, you seem pretty well along what kind of advice would you give uh people who are maybe five years behind you in their scheme man well five years behind me is is <clears throat> before i even thought about making knives uh, <laughs> but i one of the things i always tell guys that that ask me how how they could get into it or what they should do is do what i did and start with the the tl29s or the old pocket knives, get those, take them apart and figure out how to, how to put it back together. Um, and try that a bunch of times. You know, I, I did that for a year. I made, I made a couple hundred, you know, I put, took apart and put together a couple hundred, um, TL 29s. I've got a boneyard in my shop of scrap parts. You can still see them on blade forums, old sale threads. They're yeah. beautiful. I was checking them out before we, oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, so um, start with that. Take them apart. Try to put them back together. Learn what it takes for for the knife to function correctly. Learn how those parts go together. I mean, that's how I learned how to get those positions just right. The, the open, closed, and half stop was was putting together and taking apart um, those TL twenty nines because those come with a half stop, but they're not always perfect. And trying to turn a user knife into something nice. Um, I was trying to get it just right or as close as I could. And I learned what, what, I mean, there are tricks that, uh, that aren't taught that aren't published in any books that you just kind of got to learn on your own. Um, there's a, I mean, there's something cool about a slip joint that you can hack out a slip joint with, with some pretty common hand tools. Um, you know, you don't need a mill, uh, you don't need a surface grinder. Those are for those are tools for when you're you're a little farther into the game. Um, but if you just want to try it, you can. I mean, I I hacked them out with Harbor Freight tools when I when I was starting, and I've I've been able to let the business fund itself, upgrade tools as I've as I've been able to, and and that's where the quality comes from is is being able to um, upgrade. So, yeah, I think starting, starting with the, don't start trying to make your own, try to, try to fix something else. Yeah. It's like, uh, well, it's like, uh, I like how the, uh, artists of the Renaissance dug up bodies. I mean, how else are you going to learn anatomy? Yeah. You know, yeah. You, that's, you that's the right word. Anatomy. You got to pop open a couple of those Bokers or or, or uh, Winchesters or Remingtons, whatever they are. Take a look inside of them and see how th how they did them on the production line. Well, uh, Nick Timpson of Birdvis Knives, it's been a pleasure talking with you, sir. I uh, really, really admire slash drool over your knives, and uh, I think you're doing awesome stuff with in in the in the couple of years you've been in the game, and I cannot wait to see uh, you know the heights you reach as you go forward. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast. All right. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. And I love that. You are a dork <laughs> and a knife junkie. Yeah, I, I love that uh, that dork one. That's the reason I played it because you were you were throwing out some of those terms there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But it, it's, I, it's hard to resist. <laughs> yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, dorkish like that yet. I'm 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 trying to get there, but uh, we'll we'll figure it out sometime. All right, uh, cool interview with uh, Nick Birdvis Knives. Uh, main thought, big takeaway. What uh, oh. what you like? Oh, I, I mean, to me, I'm just uh, very impressed with uh, how quickly he got to the state of refinement with his work. I mean, you know, like he's, like he mentioned and like he suggested others do who want to follow in those similar footsteps, you know, he started by cracking open old uh, slip joints and figuring out how, how they work, how to put them back together, how to make new handle materials. 
And now a few years later, he's making some of the most astounding slip joint knives, uh, custom slip joint knives. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm smitten, Jim. So I got now I got to figure out how to get a bird vis knife. Great. <laughs> right. I hear you. Well, for those that are uh, watching it on YouTube or the Facebook group, I was uh, trying to put up some of the uh, pictures from his website and some of the Instagram photos uh, throughout the interview. And uh, I was like, you, man, those those things are gorgeous. They are gorgeous. They're, and you know what? I forgot to ask <clears throat> Nick while we were talking the best way to get in touch with him. I'm, uh, so we will make sure that we have his Instagram and uh, and his website uh, in the in the notes below. Um, I usually like to ask that because some someone might have something else to say, but but his uh, his IG seems very active in his website. Right. Well, yeah, and we uh, threw him up uh, during the uh, the show as well. So if you watched it on video, you'll be able to get that. But as Bob said, uh, look at the show notes so the knifejunkie.com slash one five eight the knifejunkie.com slash one five eight. We'll have links to his uh, website. Instagram, and he uh, mentioned the YouTube channel that has a couple of videos up there. We'll also uh, link over to that as well. So for The Knife Junkie, Mr. Bob DeMarco, I'm uh, Jim, the knife newbie person over here saying thanks for joining us on episode 158 of The Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to The Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.